Good morning. Good morning. All right. I know you're eyeballing the chocolates. <laughs> it's just I just decided that, you know, I have to be up here for so long on Sundays doing it. I might as well be able to enjoy myself while I am. Now, this has something to do with the big idea for today. Um, I want you to try right now, I'll give you just a couple of seconds, how many of these milk chocolate gumballs are in here? What do you think? Don't shout it out. You got it in your mind? Take a guess. Now share it with people right around you. Go ahead, turn, turn around and you share. How many, how many do you think are in here right now? <clears throat> yeah? Some of you get really serious in these moments of competition, okay? The square inch root of this. Okay, you ready? Here it is. 36,000, no, I'm kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, 936, 936 pieces of deliciousness. Did anybody even get close? Okay, those people around you, you need to take them out to lunch after the service today, okay? They're the big winners here today. You know what 936 represents? 936 is the amount of weeks you have with your kid from when they're born to when they graduate high school. 936 weeks. Mary Nell and I were talking about that this week. I asked her, I said, how many weeks do you think there are in a kid's life until they graduate in high school? She said, I'm guessing about a million. <laughs> it feels that way a lot of times, doesn't it? 936 weeks. And we're all at different places. If you have kids, you're kind of at different stages. This stage right down here, this is, this is uh, maybe some of you have about this. You've got about 100 of them or so. And you have the baby stage and the infant stage, and you love that stage, and you came home, you brought them home, and it was great. But then you realize there's a lot of work to that too because they wake up through the night. They're crying for whatever reason you can't figure out. They constantly have wet diapers. There's just a lot of work. You want to go somewhere. You want to go somewhere simple, just to a friend's house. It takes an hour preparation to get everything ready and loaded into the car to go. And in your mind, you might be tempted to think, you know what, <clears throat> just wait till the next phase. It's gonna get a lot easier. Next phase is called toddlers. Try that one on. That's the phase where all of a sudden now they're crawling around and then they're learning to walk and you're watching them do all these neat things and they, they, they figured out that they have a willpower during the toddler ages, right? And so there's just, they learned a couple of really unique words. One of those words during this phase right here, if you're at, is the word no. They learned how to say that, no. And they learned another word. What word is that? Mine. Mine. And you're thinking, okay, I can deal with this because I got to deal with this, but it's just going to get so much easier in the next phase. And that's where some of you find yourselves right here. You're, you're in this chunk right here, and that's like the elementary school age. But see, what happens in the elementary school age is that they develop this thing called a personality. And sometimes that personality clashes now. There's a little struggle there with the parent and the, and the child, and, and the parent is going, they're just busier than squat because you've got all the school stuff going on, and you're taking them to and fro school and activities after school, and sports things, and church activities. How many of you feel just like a taxi cab service, right? Forget Uber, that's you, that's you. If only you could charge your kids for all the things that you do in the car. So you got this stage right there, and they're so busy, and you're thinking, man, I can't wait till they get to high school. Because high school down here, this last, that's a breeze, right? Yeah. <clears throat> high school is where hormones kick in. Those are, those are dangerous things, whether they're boys or girls. And now, as a parent, you're focusing on, oh, i got to make sure they have the right friends, and she shouldn't be dating him, and he shouldn't be interested in her. And, and then you can't wait. They get their license. They can finally go, but then you're worried about that. And are they doing good in school? And what about college? And all of a sudden, before you realize it, they're gone. They're gone. They graduated high school, and they're gone. Here, as obvious as it seems, it is so easy to get stuck on the tasks of parenting and forget about the relationship of parenting. That we're just trying to get them through this. But here's the thing, when the kids are grown, at least out of high school and they go on, what are you gonna have with you, task or relationship? Obviously, relationship. And so we wanna make sure that we're not just focused on 
you know, missing the important things as we're going through infancy through high school and just getting the tasks done and doing our job, but that we keep first things first with our kids, and that is building a relationship because that is all that's going to matter when they reach adulthood is that relationship that we have or have not with them. So here's today's big idea. You can write this one down. Ready? It's parenting is a relationship, not a task. It's a relationship, not a task. That's what it is at the very core, a lasting, loving relationship with our sons and daughters. That's the reward that we have. And we, we wanna be careful not to invest just in the relationship part after they graduate. We wanna make sure that's central to what we're doing with our children as we're raising them. Here's a proverb, 127 verse three. Let's read this one out loud together. You ready? Here we go. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children are a gift from the Lord. Some of you are thinking, is there a return policy? <laughs> Can I get a refund? <laughs> no, it's tough. As amazing a, of a gift the children are, it's very hard to understand the magnitude of that gift until they're a lot older, right? Which is why this one mom that I uh, read about, she was asked, if you had to do it all over again, she's got her kids, six of them, and now they're in their 30s, if you had to do it all over again, would you have kids? And she said, of course, just not the same ones. <laughs> no. I think uh, parenting, uh, and you know, we've got six kids, Mary Nell and I, and for a number of years, I did a lot of parenting myself with my three sons, and it is a challenge. It is got seasons with those very difficult conversations. There's a lot of joy to it and happiness and thrill, but it is the greatest investment and reward that you can have in life, having a relationship with your kids when they move into adulthood. That's the reward. I wanna uh, mention one pitfall here because in order to reach the reward, there will come some pitfalls. Here's one. Don't make your children experience rich and relationship poor. Don't make them just experience rich as they're growing up in relationship poor. There's a huge temptation. No matter what economic status you find yourself at, uh, it doesn't matter. There's a huge temptation. We feel this pressure that we have to have so many activities for our kids that go beyond our capacity in our calendar and in our schedule that we have to get them involved in this and get them involved in that and they have to be able to do this and, they have to, and those are good things. I had my kids all in sports teams and after school activities, they had the church life and stuff. So those are good things. They learn social skills and they're, they're having fun and they're developing skills and talents and realizing who they are. But at the end of it, we don't wanna make sure that we just overloaded them with experiences and forgot the important thing that we built a relationship with them that that's key with mom, or with dad. And as we're gonna hear about in just a little bit, especially with God, that that's key. And so parenting, raising our children, that's what we're gonna look at today. And I'm tag teaming in with a, a video of our, our children's life director for East Lake, or in particular down in Chula Vista. And uh, Keith Smith, great guy, good friend. And he's had 30 years of ministry invested in children and in parenting. He knows what he's talking about. He's had his own and he's invested in this and I thought there's nobody else I'd rather to speak to our people about than Keith. And so I'll come back up at the end and wrap this up. But you're gonna enjoy this. There really are different relationships that shape us and there's really three primary relationships and they're in your outline. Let me just go over these three primary relationships. The first one that shapes us is our relationship with our parents. And we're talking parent shaping us whether we're two years old or whether we're 12 years old or we're 42 years old. Those relationships that we have with our parents shape who we are. About a year and a half ago, I met a guy. His name is Kevin. He's about 30 some odd years old. And Kevin and I just kind of struck up a friendship and I've got to know him over this last year and a half. And as I've got to know him, I've got to know his twin sister. He's got a brother. His father passed away about 15 years ago, but I've got to know who his mom is as well. And just, just a really good friendship, just kind of pulling back the curtains of life and getting to know one another. 
Then about six weeks ago, Kevin went through just a downtime in his life and really just started some destructive behaviors and ended up in having to get in some rehabilitation. And, and so while he was there, there were some counseling sessions taking, on, taking place that he invited his mother and his two siblings to come. And I was allowed to kind of be a fly on the wall to see what was taking place. And in this counseling session, basically, he just kind of put some stuff out on the table, things about his brother, things about his sister that he's dealt with his whole life. But it got time for his mom. So we talked with Kate, his sister, and some of their relationship, his twin brother, that was his twin sister. He talked with Randall, his brother, and some things they had going on. Then he looked at his mom, Rebecca, and he began to count things, even when he was a young boy, that she had done the way she had raised him and how it had shaped him as a young man. And I'm sitting there in this counseling session watching. There's Rebecca, the mom. There's Randall. There's Kate. His father, Jack, is not even there. But even some of that parenting that had been dead 15 years ago began to affect him. And some of you are kind of snickering right now and going, now, who are you talking about? I'm talking about this is us. Absolutely, I'm talking about this is us. And for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, you need to get your life right with Jesus and begin watching the best show on TV right now. But it was this counseling session, and, and here's a 30-year-old character, but he was looking back over his life and the way his mom had affected him, and I turned to my wife, and I have a 23-year-old son and a 22-year-old daughter, and I said, honey, can you imagine what they'll be saying about us in about 10 years? But just, just, I just felt that pressure, that whole magnitude of what we do then, now, in the future shapes who our kids are. That parenting relationship shapes us. Another relationship, and it's there in your outline, you can write this down, your relationship with your people outside your home shapes who you are. Your relationship with people outside your home. Peer pressure is a real thing. Ask any sixth graders heading to school tomorrow. Peer pressure is a real thing, but it doesn't stop in middle school. You know, we have Super Bowl every single year, and over 100 million people tune in to watch this football game once a year. And advertisers pay over $5 million for a 30-second advertisement spot. And in that 30-second advertisement spot, they're doing more than just advertising their product. They're trying to create brand loyalty. They're trying to create a relationship with their viewer. And in that relationship, they are trying to influence us in the choices we make and what we purchase and what we buy. And so you and I... We are shaped by outside influences, whether it is advertisers, whether it is media, the neighbor next door, the people we work with. We are shaped by those outside influences. And there's one more, the third way that we are shaped by somebody, and that is a relationship with God. You and I are shaped by our relationship with God. And you may be here today. And maybe you've been here every single weekend since the doors of this church opened up over 20 years ago. Maybe this is your first Sunday to ever be here. And you're kind of walking in going, I'm not even sure I know who God is. I can barely spell God. And you're going, how does my relationship with God, if I don't even have one, affect who I am? It doesn't matter where we are on the continuum on that relationship with God, but how we view God shapes who we are. And so our relationship with our parents, our relationship with outside people, in our relationship with God, no matter who we are in life, no matter our age, those three things shape us. And so as parents, it would make sense to me if those, things, those three areas are such shaping elements in our lives, it would make sense that as we are trying to raise our children up and we're trying to grow and mature our children, that we're making sure those three areas are healthy in their lives. And so what I want to do now, I want to share with you what I consider three game-changing questions that you can use to evaluate and to see how you are doing as a parent, regardless of the age or stage your children are in. These three game-changing evaluation questions that you can use to look and see how you're doing. Because as James pointed out, 936. Some of us may have less than that, but 936 is all the time that we have with our kids, and so we want to make sure we're doing it right. And so there on your outline, these game-changing questions, here's the first question to ask yourself. What are you doing to enhance your child's relationship with you? What are you doing to enhance your child's relationship with you? The dictionary defines enhance as to improve or make better. Now, here's the problem I want to run into as a parent, that I focus probably not on enhancing my relationship with my child, but enduring my relationship with my child, right? I mean, how many times have you looked up, if only we can get to this point, 
I remember when my kids, my, my son was born and just an infant, we brought him home from the hospital and you had to bathe your son, your child, right? And my wife and I fought over who got to bathe him because that was his bonding moment. You'd put in that little plastic tub and you'd wash him and it was like, oh, we've lived for this and this was our baby. That lasted about six weeks. And then we found ourselves selves as parents, we're playing paper, rock, scissor to see who has to bathe the child, right? And then I just, I remember the day that he, it was like, Freedom arrived in the Smith household. When my son was old enough to go upstairs, turn on bath water and give him his own self a bath. I'm like, that is freedom in the Smith household. I didn't care. He could have bathed for 16 days if he wanted to. It gave us kind of a break of life, right? But since then, do you, I found myself, you probably find yourself asking these questions. If only they can get old enough or big enough to make their own breakfast. If only they reach the point they can wash their own clothes. I can't wait till they're old enough to drive. They can take themselves to their friend's house. I can't wait till they graduate and somebody else gets to feed and take care of them while they're at school. We're always waiting for the next thing. We're just trying to endure until the next stage. But the problem is this. When we focus on enduring our relationship with our child instead of enhancing our relationship with our child, we're so focused on the end result that we miss the journey. And the journey is where the relationship is found. We will wake up one day and our child is gone and all the chocolates are gone out of the jar. But there is no relationship with our child to continue on with. And so one of the things that I found in my own life and I share with students or parents across the country is, is how do you enhance that relationship? And here's the number one best way that I've learned. We need to learn to speak their language. And not just speak their language, but speak their love language. You see, there's a book written about 20 years ago, and it's about an author by the name of Gary Chapman. And Gary Chapman identified that every single person, regardless of our age, we have the need to be loved in five different ways. And those five different ways that he outlined in his book, The Five Love Languages, are physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, gifts, and acts of service. And so every one of us need to receive these five areas in our life to feel emotionally built up, to feel emotionally healthy. But the way God has designed us, he says, is that each person has one or two of those love languages that we need to be spoken more often to us to really feel it. Because if you don't, it's like saying I love you to someone in Spanish when they actually speak Swahili. You've got to learn to speak their language. My daughter, she's 22 now. When she was six years old, I identified her two love languages. Her two love languages were... Um, physical touch and gifts and so I had to make sure I was a student just to figure those out I just studied her and watched her and just to see what, how she operated and I realized those are the two that I got to make sure I speak and so f- physical touch we had a house at that point that had stairs going straight up as, as you walk in the front door and every day when I came home, came home from work or I, or I um, went to work she'd go to the very top of the stairs and she said daddy I need my kiss I need my kiss and she'd run the top of the stairs and she'd stick her head out between the rails but of course she was three or four feet taller than I was because I was standing on the ground and I'd reach up to kiss her and there'd be this two or three foot the gap and she said oh too tall And she'd take one step down and she'd try to kiss me. Of course, she's still too tall, a little bit shorter, but still too tall, still too tall. And she'd get almost the point that we could reach and kiss and she'd run the very bottom and she'd say, too short. So she had this game, too tall, too short, till we got to the right point and I'd reach in and she'd reach out and I'd kiss her and she'd say, just right, daddy. She needed to be loved that way. Her other love language was gifts. I could go out of town and bring her a gift back, but I didn't have to spend money on it because it wasn't the value. It was the thing that I thought about her. One time I brought her a rock home. I said, babe, I bought this for you, Alex. Look, I didn't buy it. I found this. I was walking along in this little rock, and I saw that I knew God uniquely made this rock special, and it made me think of you because he made you uniquely special. And I handed her this rock that I found on the ground. She grabbed that rock, and she said, oh, Daddy, thank you. My wife looked at me and said, don't you dare bring me a rock home. I want something more than that. (laughs) Her love language is a little bit different. So this was my little girl. Proverbs 22, 6 says this. Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he's old, he won't depart. That means be a student of your child. Look at your child. Study your child. Now, when my daughter hit puberty, life changed, okay? She went from a sweet little girl to, let's just say it changed, okay? But here's what I learned. She still needed those two love languages spoken to her. It just had to be spoken in a different way. I I couldn't just bring her rocks home anymore. And she figured out this love language. And so she said, Dad, 
I'm not feeling loved right now. Can we go to the mall? And, and so she said, I want to invite my friends. She really wanted to go by herself. She knew I wouldn't let her. So she said, Dad, here's how this is going to work. I'm going to bring my friends. I know you won't let me go by myself, but you walk 30 feet behind me. And don't let anybody know that you're there with me. And Dad, when I go into the store, she said, I'm going to go shopping, but you sit outside the store where dads belong. But Dad, if I pick something out and I take it up to the counter, you know I don't have any money. Will you come love me a whole lot? <laughs> now, I realized at that moment my daughter was using me, but I also realized the number of chocolates were running out, and I still had to speak her love language, and her love language was gifts. And so I think speaking our kids' love languages is the best way that we can make sure that we're enhancing our child's relationship with us. Let me give you the second question. Second question is this. What are you doing to influence your child's relationship outside your home? They're in your outline, maybe on your app. What are you doing to influence your child's relationship outside your home? I think the scariest part of parenting is letting go. Okay. Do you remember the first time that you had to take your child to the child care or maybe even drop it off the church nursery? Just like, ooh, somebody else outside of me is taking care of my child. Or maybe your child is 10 months old and they're trying to take those first couple of steps and everybody's sitting around the phone and they're ready to post it, show grandma someplace else the pictures. But dad is like just squatted down, ready to spring across the room in case that baby starts to fall because I got to protect my baby. Or what about the time that your child begins to try to ride a bicycle the first time without training wheels? <laughs> or when you handed them the keys and nobody was going to be in the car with them but them. Those are scary days. Or if you've ever had to drop your, your child off at college, those are just, we're not made for those. They're scary. And you know why they're scary? Because we have in us as parents this innate need to protect and keep our kids safe. And so when outside influences come in, they may not take care of them. They may not speak to them. They, they may not lead them the way we want to lead them. And so it's scary because we do want to protect them. Now, there's another reason it's scary also. is because our identity is so wrapped up in our child's behavior, we're also afraid if they make the wrong choice or do the wrong thing, what's it going to look like for us? But regardless, it's this need to just kind of control and take care. And so here's what we do. We parent with the way I call parenting with exclamation points. You know, when the child is maybe a year old and they're reaching out to touch something hot they shouldn't, what do we say? Don't touch! Exclamation point. Or if they're moving around, be still! Exclamation point. No need for a one-year-old baby to have this long explanation of what you're trying to say. Just do what I tell you to and everything will be good, right? But we fall into the trap of continuing, as, even as our kids get older, to speak in parenting by exclamation points. We say things to them like, don't touch, exclamation point. Stop talking, exclamation point. Clean up your room, exclamation point. Don't watch that show. That's a friend's bad, that friend's a bad influence. Or that's a waste of your money, exclamation point. And we don't give this ch our children times to discuss and talk about it with us. Here's what we're doing. We're teaching them the right choice to make, but we're not developing any discernment in them. And so many times as we parent with exclamation points, it's not really preparing our children when outside sources begin to influence them as much as us. And so here's a suggestion for you parents. Rather than parenting with exclamation points, parent with question marks. Rather than short, simple, yes, it is easier, yes, it's more efficient, but we're not building that discernment. So instead of just saying, don't do, do this, do the way I tell you to, Ask them in questions. For example, instead of just looking at your children and say, don't watch that program, you might ask questions. What do you like about that show? Or another question could be, what negative images are being portrayed? Or what do your friends say about it? Or maybe instead of that exclamation point statement, that friend's a bad influence, you could look at them and say, why do you like hanging out with her? Or another question could be, how are some of his values different than what we have as a family? Do you see what we're doing here? You're inviting them in. Now, now, let me just put a disclaimer here. By parenting with question marks does not give up your authority. 
okay? Absolutely doesn't give up your authority, but you're valuing them enough and you're helping them, them to process the decisions that they're trying to make. So that way, when you put them out in the world or someone else has influence on them, they've learned this art of thinking critically and this idea of discernment in their own lives. And so as we think about questioning with question marks, I think that's a lot better way than questioning with exclamation marks. Questioning or parenting with question marks allows us to talk with our kids and not just at our kids. Here's the other good thing about it. It builds relationships with your kids way beyond the years that they have chocolates in the jar. Let me give you an example. My son's 23 years old. He graduated college a year ago, got married. So he's living in Texas. Big boy's job. He and his wife bought a house. They're renovating it. And so life is just kind of moving forward with them. Every day at 3.30, I can expect a phone call because my son is coming home from work at 5.30 in Texas. And he's calling just to talk. But here's what I've noticed about our relationship right now. Remember, all the chocolate's gone. I'm past my 18 years of influence. My son, when he calls asks more questions than he talks. And I think he's just looking for my opinion and what do I think about something. And so one day I was kind of weary. Him. I hope I'm not like forcing myself, you know, my opinion because I know what's best. I'm still dad, right? <laughs> and so one day I just said, son, you, you, you know this. When you ask me these questions, I'm telling you what I think, but, but I want you to know you don't have to do it my way. I release you. I bless you to kind of make your own choices. And my son, I'll never forget this. He said, oh, I know, dad. I'm my own man now but I value your input. And I think back, and I know we made a lot of bad just decisions in parenting, but I thought the thought that we parented with question marks allowed my son now when he's 23 years old for he and I to have this relationship that we value one another and we have a deep relationship together. So as you think about these, these life-changing, game-changing questions, definitely think about the question that says, what are you doing to influence your child's relationship with your home? And here's the last one I share with you this morning. Last question is this in your notes. What are you doing to advance your child's relationship with God? What are you doing to advance your child's relationship with God? There, there's two mistakes I think parents sometimes make in trying to lead their children to God and what's the best approach to take. And here's the first one. They really just kind of take a, a handoff. And here's what I mean by handoff. They bring them to church and they take them up to the children's ministry. They take them up to the student ministry. and They're like, here, you teach them about God. And I want you to know, as the life development pastor here at East Lake Church, we're doing everything we, everything we can to make your child's experience when they come to church the best. We want them to have fun. We want them to learn about God. We want them to personalize God and take the faith of their own. We're, we're, we're doing everything we can. But parents, listen to me. God did not ordain me or anybody else in our children's or student ministry to be the pastor of your children. God ordains you to be their pastor. You're more than just mom and dad. You're more than just, just kind of taxi driver. You're more than coach on the little league team. You are their pastor. And God has ordained you in that job. Unfortunately, sometimes I think parents look at the different ministries we have and go, wow, I can never do it that good. I mean, I don't have that kind of excitement. I don't know the Bible like that. And they just kind of give up that role. May we know from this day forward, as ministries at East Lake Church, we want to partner with you, but never replace you when it comes to ministering to your children. And please, just for the sake of your children and their own relationship with God, don't ever do that handoff and allow someone else to be leading them. Now, the other mistake that people sometimes make is they also do a hands-off. I've talked to a number of parents. It's like, you hey, listen, when I was a kid, my parents forced God on me. And I, I, <clears throat> I don't want to force God on my kids. And so I'm just going to kind of let them make their own choice. You know, I'm, I'm going to just, I'll take them to church or maybe ask if they want to go to church, but I'm not going to force it on them. That blows my mind. I don't know any parent that looks at their kids going, you know, brushing your teeth could be a good thing, but I'm going to kind of let you make up your own mind if you want to brush your teeth. And really as far as like changing your underwear, listen, my seventh grade son, if you want to change your underwear, you go right ahead. It's your choice. I'm not going to force clean underwear on you, right? No way. We as parents are going, no, you will change your underwear and you will brush your teeth every single day, right? Because we know that's what's best. 
Now, we can't follow them when they're 25 years old and make them brush their teeth and change their underwear, but we're hoping as parents somewhere along the way they will take ownership and realize brushing your teeth is good and changing underwear can also be very good, right? (laughs) That's the way it works when we spiritually raise our kids. We can't force God on our kids. But to give up and hands-off approach and just think it's all their own. No, we want to lead them down that path and we pray to God that at some point they, their eyes are open and their hearts are open and they say, I want the same faith that my parents have, but I want it for my own. And so please don't ever take a hands-off approach to your parenting when it comes to the spiritual life of your kids. When I was in the sixth grade, My father and I, we had a paper route together, so every Saturday morning we would wake up and we would go out and roll the papers and we'd go throw them. And I'll never forget one morning my dad, as we're rolling papers, said, son, do you ever just read the Bible? Now, I'm sixth grade, okay? That's the least thing on my mind. I'm thinking video games and baseball and starting to think girls a little bit. I'm like, no, dad. And he said, well, you ought to think about it. Just try reading the Bible a little bit every day. He said, maybe read a Proverbs. There's 31 Proverbs. Or maybe you can read Psalms. But just think about reading the Bible a little bit every day. And that was a very short conversation we had. That's all that was said about it that day. The next morning, I woke up, and I came downstairs to get breakfast. And my father was sitting at the same place he was sitting at every day, doing the same thing I'd seen him do years and years and years. But on this particular day, I paid a little bit more attention to what he was doing. You see, my family had this big old oval wooden table, and he was sitting at the end of it where he did every single morning. He had his coffee. He had his elbows leaning against the table, and he was reading the Bible. Now, again, he had done that. He didn't start that because he said to me the day before to read the Bible. This is what he always did. I just had never really noticed it. But on that particular day, I realized my father was doing something that he told me I should think about doing. And the next morning I got up and he was in the same place. Those arms were leaned on that table. He was drinking the coffee, reading the Bible. The next morning, the next morning, same place. My father died about 20 years ago. We still have that oval wood table in our family. And you can see that table today. And there are two worn spots where his elbows leaned against that table as he read the Bible every day. I have had some incredible pastors in my life that have influenced me. But nobody's influenced me more than my father. I've had great teachers and great Bible study leaders, and I'm thankful for them. But my father had the greatest spiritual influence in my family because his actions spoke louder than his words. He spoke the right things, but he lived even louder. Parents, I believe this, that our actions should be spiritually leading our kids. If we're doing one thing here, but we're saying, saying one thing here, but we go home and live a different life, I don't believe at all our kids see the picture. In fact, I had an expression one time that I had in my office that said this, speak a little, walk a little plainer, Daddy. I'm having trouble hearing what you're saying. And so our actions speak louder. And we can spiritually influence our kids' lives by how we live our lives. I want to wrap up with just a couple of just really practical ways that you can do this, because I know that can be intimidating, okay? It's a lot easier to say when your kids are out of the house how to spiritually influence them, but when you're in the middle of it, you're going, but how do I do that? How do I do that? Here's an easy way. If you're a parent of a grade school or lower, so a preschool or a grade school, did you realize this? When you bring your kids to our programs, when you pick them up here in a few minutes, they're going to have a take-home sheet. And that take-home sheet has questions about the lesson, about the Bible story that we taught them while you're in church. One of the greatest ways that you can engage and begin spiritually leading your kids is simply having those discussions. Now, I warn you, if you put that piece of paper in, in a book or lay it down to do later, it will never happen. Use it as you ride home and just make that your conversation and talk about your kids what they learned. Now, if you have middle school or high school, did you realize this? We have growth groups here at Eastlake just like our adult growth groups. And I love our student growth groups. Most of them are organized by the schools they go to, and they have questions, and they're processing. They're talking about things that they're struggling with, and they're looking at the God's Word and what God's Word says about these issues. And so one of the best ways I think that you can spiritually lead your kids is you need to lead them to get in a growth group. But let me tell you the best way to lead them in a growth group. In fact, today when you leave church, we're, everyone's signing up for growth groups, right? The mistake you can make is walk over and tell your son or daughter, I just signed you up for that growth group, so you better mark Wednesday night out because you're going there. Here's the better way to say it. 
You know, today in church, Pastor Keith was talking about growth groups. I realized I need one for my life, and your mom needs one for her life as well. So we signed up for a growth group because we want God to transform our lives as we talk and interact with other Christians. And you know what? Let's look at the idea of you maybe going to one as well. So your actions are leading and talking louder than your words are. And then here's just the last real simple just application you can use of this one. There is an app that you can download. It's called the Parent Q. Now, here's the cool thing about this Parent Q. You know this illustration that we have up here, the 936 weeks? That'd be tough to carry that jar around wherever you go, right? This app actually has you put your child's age in there, and every week it will count down the number of weeks that you have left, but not just like, oh, I only got 920 weeks left. It doesn't just scare tactic. It actually knows the age of your child and will give you developmental questions, spiritual questions, emotional questions, physical questions, just to kind of track where they are and help you engage with your kids. It is the most convenient. It is just, I wish I would have had this app when my kids were, were younger because it is incredible. But it's called the Parent Q, and it also correlates with what we teach your kids on the weekends. And so it all is just coming together in one central theme. But I highly recommend that we do the parent, that you you check into the Parent Q, because I think you really will like it. You know, parenting is tough, and it's definitely not for the lighthearted. We can all agree with that, can't we? The good news is this that we have the ability to engage outward with our kids with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit that we have inward. Lots of good points on that. I hope you're able to take some notes, regardless of where you're at in the journey, or if the journey's not even begun yet. Do you have your outline? Why don't you pull that out? Um, Here was the series' big idea. So we spent five weeks in this. Pardon me there on your outline, we can re-engage upward, <clears throat> inward, and outward by understanding that we are loved. That's, that's the key. Whether, and just think about that word, I want to re-engage. Something is of value, and I want to re-engage it. First is determining that it's of value. So whether that's with God, yeah, and he initiated it. So I can re-engage because I, he loved us first. So I'm welcome to re-engage with him Regardless of where your marriage is at, I can re-engage in my marriage with some of those principles we talked about last week and with our children. These, these weeks go by really fast and we want to carry with us into their adulthood the relationship because that goes on forever and um, it's, it's just a wonderful thing to have. So again, guys, there is no, we can't undo whatever has been done, right? But we can, we can, uh, be an example to our kids that we're continuing to learn and we're continuing to grow. And say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this this year. I'm gonna be mindful of this. I, I see how maybe I'm, I'm giving them experience overload and not relationship. And so we just wanna be mindful and move in into those areas that we know need attention. And we get to do this not on our own strength, but as we yield truthfully by the power of the Holy Spirit who gives us wisdom, gives us discernment, Gives us the grace to do these things. And there's no better investment you can make than right there with your kids. So let's pray about that this morning, okay? And just ask God to help us in the rest of this journey and that we be a community here at Venice Church that builds healthy families, marriages, healthy children, healthy relationships. Lord, we love you and we're grateful that you are invested in us, that your word is true, chock full of so many principles and and, and kingdom laws. We pray that you would help us be aware of areas that we need to give close attention to. Help us to have grace, Lord, for each different season we're at in this parenting journey. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, protect our children. We pray that they would grow with less scars and that we would build something with them by your help where we'd have an engaging, enhancing relationship with them even in their adulthood. Thank you this morning in Jesus' name, amen.